Good morning. Grab your Bible and turn to 1 Samuel chapter 8. We're going to land there uh, later this morning. For those of you that are, are just joining us for the first time, we're working our way through the Bible together this year. And uh, if you've not picked up one of these journals, this is a, just a, a tool. It's got the reading plan in it. Uh, it's also a way to kind of document your time with the Lord. Uh, it's beneficial when we're engaging with the scriptures to process what we're hearing the Lord say and how he's moving and how he's speaking. And it's cool to look back, uh, if you have something like this, to look back and see what God has spoken. Because uh, sometimes you'll see themes throughout your, your writing or your note taking. If, if, you, if you see the concept of journaling and go, I don't journal, that's not a thing I do. That was totally me uh, 20 years ago when I started doing this. Uh, and journaling for me is sometimes is just taking like bullets of the things that I'm seeing. So don't be scared by the idea of journaling, uh, but I recommend it. And for those that do um, engage in this practice, I think there's many here that could say it's transformational. Uh, so it's worth engaging in. It's just another way to internalize uh, the, the word of God to meditate on it. We talked about this a couple weeks ago. Joshua uh, was encouraged by the Lord to meditate on uh, the book of the law, to not let it depart from his mouth, meditate on it day and night. So it, it was true for him. It was important for him, but it's still important for us. It's always been important for the people of God to set our minds on the word of God, the things that he's promised, uh, and where he's leading us. Amen? Amen. Amen. Last week, Pastor Amy led us through Judges. Um, which showed very clearly what unfolds when we depart from the guidance of God. Uh, Judges reveals kind of the height of human depravity. It's not a book you necessarily, I mean, you can read it with your kids, but watch out. It's one of those types of books, right? It's, it's a book that's hard to digest, because uh, there's many atrocities that are committed, but, but honestly, it's not surprising, because God in the very, very beginning said, Listen, if you walk away from what I have provided and planned for you, it's going to equate to death. And so it's not surprising that that it takes place when we walk away from, from judges as an unfiltered projection of humanity at its worst. And Amy brought this up last week, but there's a telling statement that is kind of woven throughout judges. I'm going to list a few of the references here. But it says, in those days, uh, in chapter 17, there's no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Judges 18, in those days, there was no king in Israel. Judges 19, in those days, there was no king in Israel. Judges 21, in those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. It's kind of a theme throughout Judges. When we are left to our own devices... To determine our own way and to create our own truth? Yikes. It's no wonder when we look around the world today that things look a little bit like judges. And here's what, here's what blows my mind though. Here's what blows my mind. The people of God were an absolute mess, right? They were a mess. They were, they were walking through the consequences of their own choices. They were, they were experiencing the consequences of other people's choices. They were, they'd broken promises with God again and again. They just couldn't seem to figure it out. And as we've been reading the story, it's like, man, how could they do that? And then we look in the mirror and go, oh my gosh, how can we do that? And it's like this crazy wrestle. But even though they were a mess, the moment that they cried out to God, his mercy flooded in. It blows my mind when I read the story. Like, they were just a catastrophe. But God was faithful to his promises. They were not faithful to their side of the deal, but God is always faithful to his side of the deal. It's, a, it's an amazing part of the history of Israel. Good news for us today is that God shows up when we call on his name. Anybody thankful for that today? He shows up. God, God is near to the brokenhearted. And he's always faithful to the things that he's promised. For those who call on his name, there's healing and deliverance and there's hope. The moment we turn to God, it's not like we work our way back through all of our problems to God. The moment we turn to God, he rushes in to heal and to restore. And maybe today uh, you just need to turn your heart to the Lord. Maybe that's why you're here this morning. 
You didn't know that's why you're here. But God had something for you, and he's calling you back to himself, and you just need to turn your heart to him. All right, let's continue our adventure into the book of Samuel. We need to keep in mind what we've just been reading, because as we enter into Samuel, we're coming out of a few hundred years of riding this roller coaster of disobedience, deliverance, disobedience, deliverance. That's what the roller coaster they've been on. And sadly, in the first couple chapters of Samuel, um, there's some light shed on another issue that's going on with the Israelites, and it's an issue with the priesthood. The priesthood was this group of people that were set apart to kind of mediate and help keep the people of Israel set apart for God, But, but even the priesthood was losing a grip on their identity. In the first few chapters, we meet Eli, the priest of Shiloh, and he's got a couple of sons, and they're not described in a positive light. They're no good. The sons are no good. Not the way you want to be described for all time in the scriptures. But at the same time, even though this is the description of of some people in the priesthood, the sons are no good, things are not going well, at the same time, we read about the birth of of Samuel. So there's, there's two things that are happening simultaneously in the story. Two things. I'm going to show this visually so that we can kind of see what's taking place here. Well, well, things are spiraling from bad to worse, and this is just where we are in the arc of the story. Following from Joshua to Judges to Samuel, there just seems to be this decline. The, the people are disobedient. We see the destruction of that, but now the priesthood is starting to get unraveled, and that's horrible. But in the midst of this kind of downfall of humanity, guess what? God is still working. And he miraculously provides a baby that ends up growing up to be a prophet in his temple and a judge. And, and I'm, I love this. Here's what this helps me remember. God is not surprised by anything. Anything. He's not surprised by anything. And God is always working to accomplish his purposes. And he's faithful to that. He's faithful to complete what he started with or without our cooperation. He's good and faithful. And this is played out again and 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 again again throughout history. And in our lives today. Amen? Amen. He's so good. God work through this miraculous birth to position Samuel as the next prophet and judge for his people. But, but even, even though he raised somebody up, the people were still quite a bit of a mess. If you move into chapters 4 through 7, the people arrogantly assumed that they could use God to accomplish their purposes. Are there any examples of this that take place in the world we live in today? Where we think we can kind of harness God for what we want? They go to war with the Philistines, and in their first bout, they just get whooped, right? They just get their butts kicked. And and as they're licking their wounds, the elders of Israel get this brilliant idea. Brilliant, right? Someone should go and get the Ark of the Covenant. Because remember Jericho? For those of you that have been reading along with it, remember Jericho? The Ark went out, and the, the, the people walked around, and that thing has, like, superpower, so let's, let's get the ark and go into battle. This is going to guarantee a victory for us. So they do. They go get the ark. The ark comes into the camp, and guess what the people do? They all cheer. They're excited. The ark, the presence of God is here with us. Yay! And the Philistines on the other side hear the eruption in the camp, and they're like, oh, no, what's happening? They're excited. How are they excited? We just whooped their butts. And they're like, oh, the presence of God is there. And they've heard of the history of God's people and, and the history of God's presence. And they're like, oh, we're scared. <laughs> but then they go into battle. And the Israelites are crushed again. And they lose 30,000 troops and they run for their lives. This is a recap of chapter 4, by the way. If you haven't read it yet, that's chapter 4. Um, The Israelites, they're left feeling disoriented, beaten, fearful. We could say that morale is incredibly low. But I want to stay connected to the 
macro things that are happening here in the story. Because there's a progression that's taken place over the last few books. And the progression is worth reflecting on because it relates to our lives. In, in Joshua, the Israelites entered the promised land that they didn't earn, and then they failed to drive out the people that God told them to drive out. They didn't, they didn't completely do what God asked them to do. It starts there. In Judges, the people started doing what was right in their own eyes. Just do whatever I want. In Samuel, the people thought that they could use God to get what they wanted and were crushed. You see the progression here? Like, failing to do the things God has asked, now I'm just going to do things my own way, and now I'm going to use God for what I want. This all brings us to 1 Samuel chapter 8. The elders of Israel come up with another brilliant plan. They're full of them. And this plan is going to solve all of the problems they have. Here's the plan. 1 Samuel chapter 8, let's read together. Starting in verse 4. Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, Behold, you are old. (laughs) 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 And your sons... Do not walk in your ways. Now appoint for us a king to judge us like all the nations. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed to the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel, obey the voice of the people and all that they say to you. For they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them. According to all the deeds that they have done from the day I brought them out of Egypt, even to this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so they are also doing to you. Now then, obey their voice. Only you shall solemnly warn them and show them the ways of the king who shall reign over them. So Samuel told all the words of the Lord to the people who were asking for a king from him. He said, these will be the ways of the king who will reign over you. He'll take your sons and appoint them to his chariots to be his horsemen and to run before his chariots. And he will appoint for himself commanders of thousands and commanders of fifties and some to plow his ground and to reap his harvest and to make his implements of war and the equipment of his chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. He will take the best of your fields and vineyards and olive orchards and give them to his servants. He will take the tenth of your grain and your vineyards and give it to his officers and his servants He'll take your male servants and female servants and the best of your young men and your donkeys and put them to his work. He'll take the tenth of your flocks and shall be his slaves. And in that day, you will cry out because of your king, whom you have chosen for yourselves. But the Lord will not answer you in that day. This is another yikes from my perspective. This is, a, this is a terrifying conversation. God tells Samuel that people have rejected me. Give them what they want. And it's not going to work out. I already know this. It's not going to work out. And when they cry out to me this time, I'm not going to answer. Whew. Imagine getting this instruction. Put yourself in the story. Elders of Israel. Let's say you're the elders of Israel and you make this request to the prophet Samuel who's the mouthpiece for God. Give us a king, Samuel. And his response to you is, guys, I don't think this is, this is, this is not, no bueno. This is not a good idea. Here's what's going to happen. It's not going to be great. And guys, when you, when you do this, when you follow in this way, it's going to end just like it. we've experienced for the last 300 years. And when you get to that point, you cry out to God. He's not going to answer. Wouldn't you like to believe that that would have been the wake-up call moment? Like, oh, wait, what? <laughs> God's no longer going to respond? <laughs> that's, that's horrible. We've made a horrible mistake, Samuel. Like, we repent. God, we're sorry. You are the king. Like, we're sorry that we've messed this up. Forgive us. When we read the story, we see the whole picture, right? And it's like you're reading it going, no, don't do it again. Don't do it again. Continuing in verse 19. 
But the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel. And they said, no, but there shall be a king over us. That we also may be like all the nations and that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. When Samuel heard all the words of the Lord, all, all the people, he repeated them in the ears of the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel, obey their voice and make them a king. Samuel then said to the men of Israel, go every man to his city. This story is so unsettling. It's unsettling because it's a, it's a case study of what takes place in the human heart over time. It's very easy to refuse the guidance of God when you've become disciplined in doing whatever's right in your own eyes. Samuel flat out tells them it's not going to be a, a good idea. Their, their response Yep, but we need the kings because like, that's what the other nations are doing. So give us one of those. And th- this, has been, th- this has been the human predicament from the very beginning, isn't it? Isn't this the story all the way back to the beginning? You can trace it all the way back to the Garden of Eden. Do we listen to what God has provided and given us? Do we trust his provision, his care? Do we take matters into our own hands and make decisions based on what we see around us? This is something that we start working out very early in life. When we are kids, our our parental figures kind of play a godlike role in our lives because they're our authority and our covering, right? They provide and they they protect and they, they guide. Of course, many of us experience not great home lives and we didn't have that kind of care and protection and we're working out the tragedy of that still to this day. But, but there comes a moment for every single one of us as children where we're put in a situation with our friends or the people that we want to be a part of where we got to make a decision. Do I follow the instructions that I've been given by my parents, my grandparents, the people that oversee me? Do I listen and obey even in this situation? Or do I go along with what's going on with my friend's circle over here and do what they want because it's going to help me fit in? Because all of us have a desire to to fit in and please, we often cross that threshold, don't we? We cross the threshold to maintain our friends or relationships. Every parent in the room just takes a deep breath because this is our greatest fear, right? If you've had children, you've watched them grow up, those moments when they're out with their friends, you're just praying, I hope they make the right decisions. And the reason that we have any type of anxiety around this issue is because we were children once and we crossed that threshold multiple times. And so we know exactly what the situations are that they're walking in. And we just pray, God, have mercy on them, strengthen them, help them make the right choice. I try to teach and instruct and train them to make wise choices. But on a practical level, the more times you ignore instruction, and cross over into disobedience, the easier it is to make that decision again and again and again. Are you with me? It just gets easier and easier. One of my pastors used to say, you create an appetite for the forbidden. It builds in you. Well, this seems okay. Another way to say it is you become disciplined in disobedience. Anyone that has worked through or walked through or been with somebody who's worked through addiction, you know how difficult it is to break out of an entrenched habit because you've made the decision again and again and again. It just becomes so natural. Now, now back to our story in, in Samuel chapter 8. The Israelites had developed an appetite for the things that were forbidden. They had become so disciplined in living outside of the guidelines of God's direction that when Samuel gives them a warning, it just goes right by them because they're going to do what they want to do. Again, it's like looking in the mirror. The struggle for the Israelites is the same struggle we can face today. In the last couple of weeks, reading through Judges and Samuel, we're faced with the question, who is is king of my life. Who is king of my life? Think about that for yourself. Who's king? Who's who's lord of your life? 
Who's in charge? Who's calling the shots? Who's giving the direction? If I'm king, if I'm king of my life, then, then I set the parameters and, and the rules. And I, I determine my, my destiny. I define truth. I do what works best for me. I can protect myself. I decide my direction and my purpose. Uh, it seems that these are the waters we swim in today. This is viewed as ultimate freedom. This is elevated as the right way to live, the loving way to live. You do you, boo, or whatever. <laughs> right? We're quiet, so either you're with me or you're terrified. I don't know what's going on here. Everybody do what's right in their own eyes. Everybody doing right in their own eyes. Didn't we just read about that in Judges? That's one option. Or the other option is, uh, I can do a bit of shopping around to find a king. <laughs> like the Israelites, looking around at all the other nations. They're evaluating their circumstance. They're looking at how other nations function. And they go, hey, you know what we need? We need something like what they got. Give us one of those. Because that's going to help. He's gonna, they're gonna fight. He's going to fight our battles. He's going to lead us. Like, we'd give us a king. Today, we have many kings to choose from. People that we can connect with and identify with. Somebody who, who you know, offers leadership and hope. Someone who speaks our language. Someone who advocates for the things that we value. YouTube has a world of kings. Think about it through that lens. You got a whole world of kings there. Television, there's a lot of kings, a lot of people to listen to. Snapchat's got kings. Instagram's got kings. Maybe you found an author or a podcast that's just the right person for the job. I, I honestly think we spend more time in that one because, yes, sometimes we elevate ourselves as king, but we know ourselves. So, so it's like, eh, we know our limitations, but when we look out there, when we're on YouTube, we don't see somebody's limitations, we see their strengths. You don't see a lot of like, hey, this is how I fail and fall short. You see a lot of, this is how I'm the best. And we just, we, we all want that. And so we find our king to align ourselves with. This can happen in the church. Four years ago, remember four years ago? This thing, this thing happened, COVID happened, right? Remember that? It became so clear that we're all king hunters. Let me explain. No one knew what to do, and then everybody claimed to have the answer. And it happened like pretty quick. Like, ah, uh, what are we doing? No, this is what you have to do. And that's when the party began, right? Because all the kings started playing their trumpets, proclaiming hope and care and freedom, and this is the way to, to do things. Are you with me still? But there were a thousand different kings and they all disagreed and so we started warring with each other. We drew battle lines. What if, what if, just as a reflection on this story, what if that was a Samuel moment for us as a people? A moment for us to ask, who's my king? Uh, what if it was a moment? for us to reflect on who's actually king of my life. I don't think you need a pandemic to ask that question. I think that's an appropriate question all the time. Who is my king? Am I trying to be in charge of my life? Am I, am I looking around hoping that someone else will be in charge of my life? I'll tell you right now, if you haven't picked up on it, both those options are bad options. <laughs> you are not a good king. You're not a good king. You can't rescue yourself. You don't have the ability to shoulder the knowledge of good and evil. And you'll also not find a good king because everyone is just like you. Fallible and broken. <laughs> trying to sort things out. What we need is a different kind of king. 
one that this world cannot contain, one who is perfectly righteous and eternally good, one who is faithful and merciful, a good shepherd who cares, protects, and guides. I know a king like that. His name is Jesus. That's what the story is about. Who, who is king? Jesus is the only king worth turning our attention and our devotion to today. Period. There's no comma. There's no question. Jesus is the true king. I, I want to close uh, by listening to the audio from a sermon that was preached in 1970 by Dr. S. M. Lockridge. My guess is you've heard this because it became, it became very popular. Um, it's very, very moving. His initials stand for Shadrach, Meshach, Lockridge. That is not a more biblical name than Shadrach, Meshach, Lockridge. He was a, a pastor in San Diego. Uh, he's now with Jesus, but but man, he talks about who the true king is, who our true king is. Let's watch this together. Have you seen him? The one I desire. as we conclude with worship. I don't know what you came in here needing today. But King Jesus has everything you need. Would we just put our trust in our King? 
Lord, we uh, are humbled by who you are, that you would enter the brokenness of our world to rescue us, to restore us, to make us whole. We recognize all of our attempts to be all the things that we can't be. And we, or we repent this morning, we turn to you, the author of our life. And we ask you to come dwell with us and make us whole. Mend the brokenness in our hearts. Guide us into truth. Establish your kingdom within us and around us. That you would receive all of the glory and the honor and the praise. We worship you in this place today. King Jesus, bless your name in your name that we pray. Amen. Let's worship together.